All right, so we're, we're kicking off a new series today, and it's the Six Lies American Christians Believe. They're not things you haven't heard before. In fact, you've probably heard them frequently, and that's why we want to talk about these six things over the next, next six weeks. Now, uh, today, I want to talk about something really foundational. I want to start with talking about the Bible, and the lie is that the Bible is not trustworthy, and that's, that's the lie. So we're going to focus in. Now, the Bible is the best-selling book in history, arguably also the most criticize. There are different ways people attack the Bible. Some people attack the Bible to dig into it, to draw from the deep well of the Bible's truth, to analyze it piece by piece, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, to see what does God have to say to me. And some people dive into the Bible to try to dismantle it, take it apart, and discredit it. And the charge comes. The Bible is not trustworthy. And a lot of American Christians have come to believe this lie. And much of the reason is because we're kind of lazy about really digging into our faith, understanding our faith, and defending our faith in, in Christ-like ways. The reason we believe the lie, the Bible's not trustworthy, is because somebody said it. Somebody once said, the Bible's not trustworthy. And we say, well, that must be true. Somebody said it. You you need more foundation for your doubt in anything in life than than that. So, some of you uh, were just coming off uh, holidays. Some of you at Christmas, you had a big family gathering, and you have this this uncle maybe that he's just way out there on all topics. A relative that thinks they know everything about everything, and they spout about everything, and something came up about you going to church, and they said, well, you know the Bible isn't trustworthy. And you say, oh, well, they said it, so I guess, uh, I guess I'm just going to have to cow down and slip away into the darkness now. You would not take a hamburger recommendation from this same family member. But, but you'll back down on something like, is the Bible trustworthy? And by the way, if you had a family gathering, we touched on this in a different category last week, but if you had a family gathering and you don't have that know-it-all spouts off about everything relative, it's you. (laughs) So keep that in the works as you're thinking through what we're going to talk about today. It's really like we've heard plenty in the last few weeks about fake news, right? We're going to hear plenty more about fake news, it appears. And there's, it's just things that they, it shows up in social media, it shows up in different platforms, comes in an email to you, forwarded from somebody else, from somebody else, from somebody else, and, and it declares something, and a lot of people are taking them hook, line, and sinker, and then sharing them as fact, when in fact, they're fake news. The week it premiered, I found the Babylon Bee, and some of you have found the Babylon Bee. It's a Christian satire site. It's written to sound like news. And I get a kick out of it. They post an article or two just about every day. And uh, it's just what I need to keep me going some days. The Babylon Bee. Now, this was particular article I saved because it was talking about the Bible. It was posted back in the summer. And uh, it looks like a, a newspaper article. There's a picture of a guy, local man, on track to finish reading entire Bible by end of this century. Now... This is in June of this year, and this is what the first part of the article says. Vancouver, Washington, which, you know, maybe that's part of the problem. (laughs) Following an intensive reading plan that calls him to read a few verses of Scripture weekly at a minimum or whenever the mood strikes, local man Ray Sutton, 41, is reportedly still on track to complete a full reading of the Bible by the end of the century. That's, uh, That's a few decades out yet. The article quotes him, I'm excited and I'll admit a little surprised that I've been able to keep up like this, Sutton told reporters Monday, adding that his last attempt to read through the Bible didn't even last a month. He said, but, but that was one of those 20-year plans. It was way too aggressive for a guy like me. <laughs> and it goes, it goes on to tell his story about uh, that complicated 20-year plan for reading the Bible. It's just not enough time and now he can finish reading the Bible by the end of the century. Well, it's interesting, it's, uh, it's humorous, and it's not true. Now, that's, that's where this circles back around. Christians, and I'm talking about evangelical, Bible-believing, uh, Bible-living Christians, 
And this is how we approach it at our church. And different churches approach this differently. We believe the Bible is the word of God. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And I don't do that blindly. I don't do that in some kind of lazy fashion. I do that because I have dug deep and looked hard. And have found it to be reliable. It it contains the ideas related to the nature of God, the nature of Christ, the nature of us, the nature of salvation, and so much more. And here's, here's where this comes around. These topics described in the Bible that are big theological things. The Bible is trustworthy. And if the Bible is not trustworthy in the things that aren't the big sweeping theological things, if it's not trustworthy in history or geography or some of the just basic factual measurables, then you start saying, well, is it really true that Jesus is the only way of salvation? And some of those things come to be questioned. So it's important that the Bible be a trustworthy book. So what does it say? How does it say it? What do the critics claim? And how do we respond to those who would try to undermine the authority of Scripture by saying the Bible is not trustworthy? There are plenty of modern day attacks on Scripture. One of the more popular ones in, in my lifetime, uh, 2003, and really what this did, it just opened the door for a series of things that just repeat this same message uh, on television programs on a regular basis. You know that at Christmas time and at Easter, there are an, uh, a variety of uh, television programs that pop up and articles that are going to be written in major publications, uh, news journals, newspapers, and the like, that that are going to attack the credibility of the Bible and attack the, the validity of the Christian faith and go after the basic Bible story. But it's become really prominent, especially since 2003, more so because of a popular book that became a New York Times bestseller and stayed there for a long time, a book called The Da Vinci Code. And it's a fictional book, and it's a thriller, and it's a fun read, and it's a page-turner, and all that stuff. But as a fictional novel, a Dan Brown, who wrote the book, he, he makes reference to, well, and of course, the church lied about Jesus. The Bible, of course, is, uh, was not true in this regard. And he threw out a, a lot of conspiracy theories that have been there for several centuries, but he made it sound like... He had just discovered all this, and a lot of people took it hook, line, and sinker. It's a conspiracy story with drops of truth and a sea of misinformation and falsehood. And it it works like the fake news. If enough people hear it, and they hear it often enough, they're just going to start believing it. So, some of you have seen those specials. Uh, There was one uh, in early December doing all these things, why the whole story of Jesus' birth and all that is not true, and why the Bible's wrong, and it it tries to dismantle all this. And some of you would say, well, it must be true. It has to be true. It was on the History Channel. Okay, the same place with ice road truckers and UFO uh, (laughs) hunters, that History Channel, you know, we, we have to be a thinking people at least. The writings that Dan Brown attacked and that these specials on TV and other places attack is are the Gnostic Gospels. And, you know, there, there are a lot of books written about religion in the world, and the Gnostic Gospels are some of those books. And I've read through, I think, about all the uh, Gnostic Gospels at this point in my life. And you find them to be different kinds of books than what you're used to in the Bible. Uh, among And, and the, the charge is... They were kept out of the Bible. There was a conspiracy. And we love a good conspiracy, don't we? We love that there's some secret something going on. Well, the Gnostic Gospels fall into that category. And first of all, one of the the most accepted that some people thought maybe it should be in the Bible. And the reason people thought that is because it quotes a lot of Bible. The Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas, okay, it has the name of a guy from the Bible on it. And it quotes a lot of the gospel accounts, word for word. So it sounds a little like the Bible. But here's what we know about the Gospel of Thomas. It was written in the second century after Thomas was long dead. So it wasn't written by Thomas. And, and it just says a lot of stuff that doesn't seem to flow with what the rest of the Bible says 
in kind of weird ways. But there are people, oh, yes, these hidden books, these secret books, they need to be in the Bible. Well, here's a couple of quotes from the, from the Gospel of uh, Thomas. It quotes Peter, good old St. Peter, Apostle Peter is saying, women, you, you're going to love this, women are not worthy of life. That's the end of that sentence, too. That's just where he left it. So, if you're good with the Gospel of Thomas, put that on, on uh, your plaque on the wall. He also quotes Jesus is saying, <laughs> Jesus says, I will make Mary a male. For only those females who make themselves male are worthy to go to heaven. And so these are the books that they're arguing for on these TV specials, in these articles, in uh, something like uh, Da Vinci Code. And it's just crazy talk. Uh, when the, there was the book, and then the movie came out, and then a follow-up to the movie came out that all had the same, you know, Tom Hanks was in the movie. All, uh, all these things flowed together, and I saw different articles and interviews about it all, and one lady said, Dan Brown's book was truthful, or it would not have been published. <laughs> you, you, you see, we're not an intelligent people. I don't know where the breakdown was there, but that's, that, that was, it wouldn't be in print. And man, there's plenty of that out there. They wouldn't be in print if it wasn't true. Another man, this is a man who said, after reading Brown's novel, he said, I will never go back to church again. It's like, well, I, I, over the holidays, I watched Rogue One, and I'm never getting on a spacecraft again. I'm, well, it's crazy talk. We, there was a symposium in Allen when the, the week before the movie came out and, uh, about the book, and the library meeting room was packed. People standing around the walls three deep. And I got there early, got a good back seat, which is a, I'm always looking for a good back seat. Someday, when I retire, I will sit on the back row of some church somewhere. And as uh, <laughs> I sat there, they had, they had somebody that came in that said, the Da Vinci Code is, it is history. That's how it really happened. Secret stuff, the church, all this stuff. Another person, uh, Daryl Bach, if you're familiar with Daryl Bach, uh, he was saying, no, it's not. And Daryl just... Uh, uh, Professor DTS, he pretty well dismantled the other guy a piece at a time and left him in a puddle on the floor. But, but the guy who was there to say the Da Vinci Code was history, he, he said, looking out on this crowd of somewhere 400, close to 500 people, he said, how many of you believe that Da Vinci Code is absolute history and that how it tells the story of Christ, the church, and everything else is absolutely true? And hands shot up all over the room. Including people you know. Prominent people you'd know in town. That's the nature of discerning truth. So we're going to talk about some things. The Bible is the most beloved and hated book ever written, I guess. And people spend their lives either defending or, or trying to destroy it. As I share this message with you on the, the reliability, the trustworthiness of Scripture, the Bible... I recognize if you came in today and you say, well, I, I, don't, I don't think it's really there. I'm, I'm, I don't expect that I'm going to be able to convince you in a few minutes here that it is. And there are things in the Bible that are really factual and measurable. And there's some things that you're still going to have to take a step of faith to say, I believe Jesus was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life and died on the cross for the sins of the world. There's some faith steps in there. But I want, I want you to hear this. There are faith steps to a lot of things you already believe. That you don't, you don't know how it works. I got up this morning. And I turned on the lights in our bathroom. And you know what? As a uh, Bible and theology major. I still don't understand how that works exactly. But I have faith that it does work. And that's a very simple thing. And some of you could explain that in great detail. But there are things in all of our lives. That you're taking a step of faith. So taking a step of faith is not a monstrously complicated thing. The other part about taking a step of faith is uh, when it comes to things like the theory of evolution, there are things about it that are, I, I can say, okay, I can, I can roll with you on that. And then there are big gaps in that plan to say, I'm not sure I have enough faith to believe that. That it's too broad. It's too big of a, a leap for me. 
I got enough faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, died on the cross for sins of the world. I don't have enough faith to believe the theory of evolution. So there are faith steps you take in a lot of different areas of life. So don't think that taking a step of faith is uh, going to disqualify something as credible. And as a Christian, just know this. You're not living by blind faith. You have a lot of substance to what you believe and what you believe about the Bible. Now, I also plead with you as a follower of Christ. We touched on some of these things last week. But as you share with people, share... (laughs) Share from your heart, share your convictions, but listen to their doubts without attacking them. Share your heartfelt convictions about what the Bible believes, but do it with love and respect. Uh, Because we don't want to win an argument, we want to win people to faith in Jesus Christ. Now the Bible makes strong internal statements as to its truthfulness and benefit, the The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. It's all about the Bible. It's all about the Word of God, God's precepts, God's laws, God's teachings. Every verse talks about God's Word. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the prophet said, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Here's the the things I'm about to describe to you. I'm going to do fairly quickly and... This isn't an all-inclusive list of everything about why you should trust the Bible. And you, there are books, volumes of books, lots of resources available to help you break out the details of this, to show you the evidences for it. So be willing to lean into really dig. If, if, this is, if you're counting on this for eternal life, this relationship to God, you, you ought to have a discipline and you ought to have an inclination and an open heart to say, I'm going to really be good at this. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to grow in this. So here are some things that you ought to consider when it comes to the Bible. Uh, The Bible is reliable. The Bible is trustworthy because the manuscript evidence. There are more copies of of these biblical manuscripts than any uh, other body of ancient literature. And here's what you find is these, these copies of Scripture that are ancient, ancient. They're incredibly consistent when they're in different parts of the world, and they were ancient in different parts of the world, and you bring them together, they're the same, and they're consistent. The message is the same. The words are the same, and it is trustworthy. There are things, uh, things written by Plato, uh, Aristotle, Socrates. We call him Socrates, where I come from. The school district in Victoria is not always on board. But, but there are things that they say, well, here's what, here's what he wrote. And there's something that's dramatically different right here. The, the, the manuscripts don't line up as ancient literature. They're so divergent in, in how they are described. And yet the Bible's so consistent. The manuscript evidence. Textual attestation is a great way to say that. Second thing is archaeological evidence. Again and again, archaeological sc- discoveries have verified the accuracy of historical geographical, cultural references in Scripture. And here's what we find. The more archaeologists dig, the more proofs they find, and the the more it confirms the Bible. Uh, Every time they turn over a rock, it says it. And and archaeology has never refuted anything in the Bible. In those measurable, factual details of Scripture, the Bible is reliable. And that doesn't mean, okay, so everything it says about eternal life and salvation and all that, then that's proven. By, but it does mean if those things are all in line, you can have some, some, some faith that is founded on foundation in those spiritual truths in God's Word. Eyewitness accounts is the third thing. The Bible is written by people who witness the events it describes. And those people, you look at the New Testament period, they, they witnessed the events, and that's also how they could verify it. That's why the, gospel, the four Gospels we have were written in the first century when there were still people around who could say, mm, that's not what happened. They could have refuted what Thomas, uh, Gospel of Thomas said. No, that's not quite how that worked. Well, the Gospels are written, and they're written by people, eyewitnesses, or, they, or people who are direct associates of eyewitnesses of the events. And those... The, those, those followers, they, they all died for their faith in Christ. They lay down their lives. Now, here's the deal. People will die for something they think is true, 
even if it's not. But people don't die for something they know is a lie. They're not going to lay down their life for something they know is false. These folks gave their lives to render testimony to their faith in God's word, in the testimony of Jesus Christ in that word. Fourth thing, uh, corroborating accounts. And, And that just means you have the Bible and you have all these cultural and all these things references cultural, uh, geographical, historical. And then you have people like Josephus. If you've seen the works of Josephus, it's just a big old book. And Josephus was a historian. He lived in the first century. He overlaps with a lot of the biblical characters in time. He, he lived the same time. Some of the people you, we interact with in the scriptures. And Josephus just affirms and acknowledges he's not a Christian. He's not a follower of Christ. But he's telling the same story of the Bible. There are lots of resources outside of Scripture that point back and say, what the Scripture says about this variety of stuff, it, that, that's what happened. And that's how that worked. And there, there are a variety of corroborating, that's a hard word to say, uh, Sylvester the cat kind of word. Fifth, literary consistency. Here's this Bible. It's 66 books. It's made into one book. 66 books written by 40 or so different authors over about 1,500 years on three different continents. And these are people that didn't know each other uh, over these long time periods. And yet, this book comes together and it has this unified theme and it has this flow to it where it all fits together in this amazing supernatural kind of way that gives evidence it was a divine author. It would be like all of us saying, okay, we're going to write a murder mystery novel and I'm going to write one chapter, and you're going to write a chapter, and you're going to write a chapter, and you're going to write a chapter. We're not going to talk about our story line. We're not going to talk about our theme. We're just all going to write our chapter, and then we're going to come together, and it's all going to flow and make sense and be the greatest bestseller in the history of the world. That's the supernatural nature of this book assembled. The literary consistency is amazing. Prophetic consistency. Uh, just, just in relationship to Jesus, there are over 300 different prophetic statements in the Old Testament that point to Jesus in the New Testament that are fulfilled in Christ's life and death and resurrection and His teaching. And oh goodness, uh, the supernatural part of that, the, the internal consistency uh, uh, of that bears witness that this is the Word of God. Uh, And again, there are volumes written about these topics. Expert scrutiny. The early church had a highly uh, advanced standard for which books were judged to be authentic. They did not say, uh, oh, you have something you think is the Bible? Okay, well, we'll just slide it in here between Jude and 1 Peter or something. Okay, now that's Bible. They had a criteria, and it was, it was strict, and it was disciplined, and it was a scientific sort of approach to what was going to be in and what was not going to be in. It wasn't a random editing process, expert scrutiny. To be in the Bible, the Gospels, and, and through the New Testament, had to be something written by an apostle or a direct associate of the apostles. It had to, it had to be consistent with teaching that was in those books that we find, the Gospels and the like. And it had, this is the other part, it had to have widespread use among the churches, which meant that they looked at this, and you couldn't have somebody in Antioch of Syria who says, hey, up here in Antioch, we got this book. Man, we love it. We think it's, it's good for Scripture. Well, the people in Rome and the people in Jerusalem and the people in Corinth that were believers they had to see it too, and they had to say, yeah, that, that has a supernatural quality. It's beyond, what, uh, beyond what's written in the newspaper. That's something special. It had to be over different cultures, different language groups, uh, different time periods that they came together and said, there is something unique here. And then that's the expert scrutiny. Then global influence, the Bible. The Bible's had greater influence on the laws, arts, uh, Ethics, music, literature, world civilization, than any book in history. And, and there's really not any other book that comes close. It's responsible. This Christian faith, is, as shared in the Bible, is responsible for a disproportionately large number of humanitarian advances in the history of civilization. And there are things in education and medicine and law and the fine arts and 
and human rights, natural sciences, that the Bible declared long before anybody else in, in science or in all these places, education, we're thinking these thoughts even. The Bible was declaring what was true because it's from God. And then changed lives. And this is a simple part of this. There's a story of changed lives in the Bible. And when, when I read the Bible, this is my story too. That my life has been changed by the message of this book, by the Jesus I met through the agency of this book. And he makes a difference in my life every day as it has introduced me to the Savior. And God's story revealed in his book has connected with my story in some eternal ways. Now... Let's read our text for the sermon today. Does that worry anybody? It worries me. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. And uh, this is, we've already shared several scriptures, but this is another. Peter says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That there's a supernatural quality to that which is the word of God. It is the voice of God to this world. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter called every Christian to always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And, and that just means we all need to be equipped to respond to critics. We shouldn't be caught flat-footed on this. We shouldn't be bowled over by... That person who says, well, you know, the Bible's not trustworthy. We need to know how to respond, and we need to do it in love and grace and truth. No other book in the world more deeply cherished, more deeply hated than this book that is before me just now. We refer to it, the Holy Bible, the Word of God. It's always been, always will be a book that wraps a lot of intrigue around it, and this is a big deal. And that's why, as we planned for this series of Six Lies American Christians Believe, we want to start with the Bible because everything we believe, everything, every truth that we declare from this place is something that's drawn from God's Word. Sometimes we take it for granted that the entire, our entire society, like everybody, well, everybody believes the Bible. Everybody knows what the Bible says. That, that's not at all true. And in fact, it's becoming less and less true Many of our friends and families, family members, have, have never read the Bible at all. A lot of Christians who say, I, I name Christ as my Savior, have, have never had consistently, especially God's Word, speak to them by spending time in this book. The question comes down to this. It, is this thing called the Bible really just a good book full of advice and guidelines and encouragements? Or is this God's book intended to tell us how to live, how to have a right relationship to God, to know, his, know our Creator, know His plan for our life, and know Jesus as our Savior? Some people in the religious world wish to downplay this debate over the Bible. A lot of people, and this has become a prominent thing in a lot of circles to say, you know, I think we ought to just stop worrying about all that stuff the Bible says. And we, we just need to love Jesus. Let's just love Jesus and stop worrying about this book all the time. And I, I have encountered that at so many different levels in our culture and in conversations. And the question I would ask is, tell me about the Jesus you know that other than this one. Tell, tell me about this imaginary Jesus of yours. And... Sometimes uh, you just, I, ha I have asked, well, people say, I just don't believe Je in Jesus. Well, tell me about the Jesus you don't believe in. Well, he's this, 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 this. Okay, well, that's different than the one in here. We got a lot of imaginary Jesus problems that we have to deal with. Let's deal with the one that is here. And most people still don't know the Jesus of the Bible. Now, A couple of years ago, 95 million Americans watched a TV miniseries called The Bible. 95 million Americans, this is almost a third of our population of our country, watched a miniseries called The Bible. So there is an interest in this book, God's Word. Today, more than any other time, 
more Christians are being put to death because of their belief in Jesus Christ and in the truth of this book than ever before in history. There's, a, there's an organization called Open Doors. They said, 2016, the church of Jesus Christ, people who named Christ as Savior, more people gave their lives, more people, in fact, they, they say 215 million Christians were in high to extreme persecution in our world. Now, we think, you know, we're, we have it difficult, uh, have difficulties in this country, but it's so extreme in other places in the world. And here we are in these United States, and most of us have multiple copies of God's Word, and they're faithfully gathering dust somewhere in our homes, as most Christians aren't reading them faithfully. Meanwhile, there are all these other people that they're smuggling copies in of the preciousness of just having one copy of the Word of God available to them. That They're willing to risk their life to be able to hear what God has to say from this book. There are people in our country that burn and rip pages from the Bible and protest or disgust. And I want to edit this Bible to make it fit me and fit my world and fit my culture better. Meanwhile, there are people in the world that gently tear pages from this book or fracture little fractions of pages from this book so that they can distribute it among their community fellowship of believers because there's a chance that they're going to be captured, they're going to be arrested, and they're going to be executed for even possessing a copy of the Bible. So if they spread it out, if they lose one piece, somebody else is going to have the other pieces of what is a precious and eternity declaring book. There have always been and there always will be skillful attacks against the authority of Scripture. And the thing is, if, if the attackers can diminish, can diminish its claim, disprove its content, show it to be an error, then, then they're, they're really off the hook on authority. They're free to believe whatever they want to believe and no restraint, no moral, intellectual uh, difficulties. Uh, Voltaire was a French philosopher. He died. He died in 1778. Uh, not long before he died, he made this statement. He said, a hundred, in a hundred years, Christianity will be swept into in antiquity and remembered no more. Fifty years after he died, the Geneva Bible Society purchased his house because he had a printing press. And they started printing Bibles on his printing press. God's word... Uh, not going anywhere. Thomas Paine, familiar from American history, died in 1809. And he really embraced that spirit of the Enlightenment. And in our emerging country, he authored a book called The Age of Reason. And some of you, I, I had to read it for American literature. I read The Age of Reason back when and still have a copy. And he wrote, in five years from now, and he died in 1809, Somewhere before that, he said, in five years from now, there will not be a Bible in America. I've gone through the Bible with an axe and cut down all its trees. Well, Thomas Paine's been cut down, but the Bible's the bestseller every year in our country. Here's what you need to understand. When it comes to this discussion, most people who will throw out an attack on the reliability, the trustworthiness of the Bible, don't have any idea what they're talking about. They've never actually researched it. And that there are people who are really good at this and they have dug in deep and they're, they're going to fight you hard. But most people, 99.9% .9 of the population, who would say, well, I don't think you can trust the Bible. I don't think the Bible's reliable. They just heard it somewhere. Somebody said it once. Or they're having some personal difficulties with something in it. And... Really, the case, the, in all likelihood, the case when it comes to doubting the trustworthiness of the Bible is not, it's not whether or not it's true for most people. The question is, is it authority over me? Do I have to do what it says? Because if I believe it's true, I'm going to have to change some things about my life. And authority is the bigger issue. Why should I do what it says? Uh, the, the New Yorker magazine and so I, love, I 
grab articles from there periodically. It's interesting social commentary, real way on the liberal side of most every issue. But the New Yorker had an ad earlier this year, or, or, well, 2016. Uh, and I grabbed it when I saw it because I thought, oh, this is too good to pass up. I got to hang on to this. I'll talk about the Bible sometime in the next year. And so you're getting it. The New Yorker magazine had this, it was an ad in the magazine. It had a photo of a necklace and the necklace had this uh, scroll shaped pendant thing hanging from the necklace and, and you could open the top of it and you could put in a little piece of paper and you could put it back and it was called a spirit scroll. So now this is, it's a, and the reason, what drew me to the New Yorker was an article about the Bible when you can't trust it. And then there's this ad. The ad read, this is my spirit scroll. I keep inside a reminder of what's important to me. I walk down life's path with eyes wide open and senses awake to discover the unveiling of my spirit within. My spirit scroll is my compass. Now, there are people who will say, you know, that Bible's just made up. It's, it, it's, it's just an old document that's way out of date. It's been proven to be false. It's okay. Well, tell me, tell me where your source of truth is. My spirit scroll. Really? Could I ask you some questions about that? Do you still drive a car? Uh, you seem dangerous to the world that you would... You probably wouldn't say that if you're doing the grace thing I talked about earlier. You just think that in your head. It's okay to think it in your head, but you shouldn't say it out loud. But that really embodies what a lot of people want to believe about God anyway, which is, I want, I want a God that, well, He embodies my philosophy of life. And so it makes me my own authority. I'm my own scripture. I play by my own rules, and I don't need a God to tell me what to do or how to live, because we just ultimately don't like anybody telling us what to do. We live by our own rules, however, whatever. So, why don't we believe the Bible deserves our allegiance? And I want to, I want to give you an idea about how to approach this, because some of you are going to run into people. You've already run into people. I have these conversations with people that, that they don't want to push the Bible out of the way and try to discredit the Bible. And really, they're not that equipped with a big argument. It's more of a personal preference sort of thing. And so how do you overcome that barrier? And here's an idea for how to do this. Maybe instead of saying, you need to believe the Bible, you need to believe the Bible, you need to believe the Bible and argue from that standpoint. Maybe take a step back and say, have you ever read the Bible? Would you join me in reading the Bible? Let's open this thing and see what happens. So here are some, just four factors of belief. How... God can work through uh, this process with somebody. Factor number one, four quick things. Plausibility. It's just opening a door. You, you just need to crack the door open for people to explore God. So plausibility. And so isn't it reasonable to believe that if there's a God who created everything, isn't it reasonable to believe that he might want to talk to us sometime? And isn't it reasonable to believe if he was going to communicate with us about stuff, he might write something down in some inspired way? Isn't that reasonable to believe? And for a lot of people, they go, well, yeah, I guess. Because 99% or 90% of Americans still claim, as a survey last year, still say, yeah, I believe there's a God. They may have a lot of definition for that. So the believing God's not real hard. Now, if you run into somebody that says, I don't believe in God, and that does happen too, then, you know, it's a simple thing of, uh, okay, out of everything there's to know about everything in the world, you know, how much would you say you know? What percentage? Of everything there's to know about everything. Well, you know, it's an outrageous boast to say, I know 1% of everything there's to know about everything. That would be crazy for anybody. And so, okay, well, out of all that other stuff that you don't know, do you, do you think there's any possibility that God might be out there somewhere? And if God's out there somewhere, don't you think it's just reasonable that you ought to maybe, maybe open up the best-selling book of all time and do a little exploring just to, just to see if, Maybe there's more to this than you realized. Now, second thing uh, about the Bible, messiness. The Bible's messy. It's not a tightly edited, okay, we're going to clean up the stories about all these people. 
We're going to make this so these guys are all heroes who always did it right. Because that's not how it's written at all. We see people as they are because God sees us as we are. So the Bible works that way. And it's a complicated book. There are a lot of cultural things you have to overcome. A lot of historical things. We're not good at, we're not good at thinking uh, in terms of things that are hard. We want easy. It has different types of literature. Some of us, we love a good narrative. We love a good story. We're not as much into poetry, and there's some poetry in there, and you're going to have to work through some of that stuff. There's, there are different kinds of literature. It's written, again, by 40 or so different people over 1,500 years on three different continents from different cultures. And so there are things you overcome, but there's still this amazing continuity. And this book, the Bible, has, there's emotion, and there's rational stuff, and there's social stuff, and physical stuff, and spiritual stuff, because God inspired this book. He cares about our whole life. And if God inspired a book to be the medium of our spiritual enlightenment and instruction, don't you think, and this is to try this out on folks, don't you think it ought to be a little bit untamed? That it ought to be uh, a little challenging? That if God wrote a book to us, it ought to render us more children than experts in the topic? Skeptics have seldom read the Bible because it's weird. It doesn't read like a newspaper to most people because it's hard. And when people say that, say, absolutely, came from God. It's going to be complicated, going to be big. But ask them, do you have a modern translation of the Bible? I love the King James Version of the Bible. Most of the scripture I've memorized comes from the King King James Bible. But there are fantastic, accurate translations of the Bible that aren't King James. It might be easier for them to read. And if you can make... Make it just a little more accessible with language. That's a, fa- that, that's a great step that you can take. And then say, hey, this is a Bible reading plan. Uh, take them to that version site and say, hey, how about this one? Because it's just a book about, it, it's a reading plan. And you can, you can choose a reading plan that won't bury them in Leviticus the first week that they're reading the Bible. That's... I love, I, I read Leviticus last week, and man, I love Leviticus. Be holy because I'm holy. And there's all kinds of things about Leviticus that really inspire me at this stage of my spiritual life. But it may not be your first book you want to read in the Bible. So get them to read a Bible reading plan with you. Ultimately, you just want them to read the Bible because, you know, God's Word is powerful, and God's Word changes lives. So it penetrates hearts. Get, let, let God's wor- Word do the work. Uh, factor three is rel- uh, Reality. Once a person is open to reading the Bible and learning, you might begin to share some of those little evidences and archaeological things like I talked about earlier. That's not the first round because we, we live in, I have a sermon in a month and I'm using uh, Cambridge uh, Dictionary declared their word of the year for 2016 was post-truth. We live in a post-truth world. Truth whatever you want it to be. And... Uh, Oh, that's interesting. Well, we live in a post-truth world, so facts sometimes, like those, that list of things I gave you a while ago, that there's, absolute, there's great stuff there, but it may not be the place to begin the argument in a post-truth world where people, well, don't confuse me with the truth. I want to believe what I want to believe regardless of the facts. Uh, but as you're reading the Bible with them, you might, oh, there's a story about Pilate. And uh, it's one of my favorite little ditties in there. There's Pilate. Jesus on trial before Pilate. He's governor in Judea. You know, did you know? Historians didn't think there's such a guy. They thought it was made up. He didn't show up anywhere else in ancient literature. They said, well, there's another place where the Bible's wrong. And then in 1961, I was born in 1961. That's like yesterday. In 1961, they're bumping around in Caesarea by the sea and they find the pilot stone. And it affirms everything the Bible says about who he was, what he was, and where he was in history. And there's a replica of the pilot stone at Caesarea. And then I stood this close to the original in the, in the, in the museum in Jerusalem. I said, because the Bible's true. Ain't that cool? Anyway, let's go back and read some more. But you just throw out just little bits and pieces of how the Bible is reliable and trustworthy in the details. Then factor four is just need. 70% of this book is, is story. It's a narrative. 
And any good story has a tension in it, right? Any good, if you're going to read a book, you're going to read a novel, you're going to read a, watch a movie, there's, there has to be a tension. And so here's the tension. God created everything. And he created us to be eternal beings and to have relationship to him. But then we messed up that relationship. Sin scrambled that and there's a separation between us and God. There's a tension in this story. So we need a hero. God sends Jesus to fill that gap, to fix that problem, to be the, to be the Savior. And by faith in Him, we can have our crisis solved. And here's the part that you, you, you have to get to is, so that's God's story. Here's the great part. Personally, my story is intersected with God's story. Because that story of what Jesus came to do has intersected with my story. He did that in my life. And suddenly, God's story and your story intersect in their story. Your friend's story, your family member's story, and God's story intersect. And something eternal happens. I want you to, to know, because I have I spent a lot of time working on this and studying this, God's word is trustworthy. It is the word of God. 